Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and faces of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. And today, we shall be investigating one of the most terrifyingly powerful categories of combatant in the entire setting. Rarer than rooster teeth, they are only found in one single bloodline of the Astartes, the Space Marines. And even among that line, they are the few, for they are the gifted. Now I have been known to sometimes just leap into the lore, but feel that now it is time for me to get back to my roots. There are now so many who will chant the law verbatim, possibly adding in a frisson of gutter humor or expletives to spice things up. Why not? It's all just light entertainment after all. Yet, as gifted as I am in the deployment of ribald vernacular in other arenas, I feel that it does not fit with that which I am attempting to achieve for this channel. Your relaxation. Thus today, I wish to present the information in the format that I am best known for, via a little tale. For there is nothing quite like being shown, not told, the what, where, or when of the matter, no? But before we get to the elucidating story, please bear with me as we hear this word from the sponsor of this video. A game without compare, with luscious graphics and hectic action, and with 5 million concurrent users, it's an event you need to get in on. Easy to learn, a challenge to master. This game is a pocket rocket and all in the palm of your hand. Free to play on your mobile phone or PC. It is a gift from the guards. Just look at it. It's gorgeous. If you sign up today, you get bonuses worth $100. Epic champion Lady Antessa, 500,000 silver and more. Plus, if you grind hard at 25th level, you unlock another boost. Another half a million silver. Epic skill tombs, potions, the works. And that's not all. After downloading via my link, use a festive promo code FESTIVAL5 to get another epic champion, Tyrell. 500 silver and endless amounts of other rewards. I wish I'd gotten these when I'd started playing. Just hit the links in the description or scan the QR techno thingy and you are away. It's that simple. And it's got everything you need for an amazing experience. The Doom Tower, the Hydra, Al Narema, the Sand Devil, Live Arena's Champion Lore, Mythical Champions, and the epic adventure, the Cursed City, with over 100 levels. And it does not get stale, as features are added regularly. So come to the world of Teleria and celebrate the fifth anniversary of this ground-baking game. Raid Shadow Legends. Start your legend today. Many thanks for your patience. And now, on to the main event. Blood of Steel. Epistolary Jubiel lay on his back, looking up at the fire-wreathed skies. A single tear trailed down his soot-blackened face. With loathing, he felt it slowly creep down his face and onto his neck. He could not move. He was paralyzed. It was a wonder that he was still alive, clinging to the light with a will forged over centuries of struggle. Despite it all, the physical, mental, and spiritual excruciation he now suffered, he could not and would not let go. He fought so hard, not only for each breath, not just for life, but also against the rising tides within him. He was almost lost to it. He could feel his sanity slipping away in the maelstrom that were his thoughts. He could hear the hum of a bridge subtly in the background. He could see the flashes of dark and light. He was nearly gone. He held on with the very fingertips of his soul, using all of his last will to resist it. The rage but this left him unprotected from the emotions that coursed through him. He wept. Not out of fear, not even out of loss. Certainly not out of weakness, but out of sheer frustration. He could do nothing in this state. 
If he could let go of his control long enough to strike back, he would be lost. But it was so hard to watch what he had, to experience what he had, and to not let go, either of life or of his sanity. But he would not yield. He would never yield. He would not give in and make a mockery of hundreds of years of discipline. He would not die a beaten, howling thing, struggling on a broken hillock, raging impotently as he went into death. The light above was thrown into shade as the demon now towered over him, a thing at least twice the height of a man, its long wide wings curling now around the broken marine beneath him. Its touch singed the armor of the marine as the demon lifted it up, so Dubiel could see properly. Its red face cracked into a leer as it brought Dubiel up to eye level with it. The demon had a struggling figure in its grasp, its red warplate gauntlet slamming into the digits of the demon to no avail. The demon, Dola Latour, the pain bringer, slowly brought the struggling marine up to his moor. Like a cat finished playing with its quarry, the demon now pushed Brother Caramon's head into its jaws and sunk them into his neck. The head came off to be spat out by the demon as it now raised the corpse above itself like a delicacy, and Dolor Latour drank the blood that profusely shot from the stump. Dubiel thought to hock and spit in its eye, but he could not. His breath now swift and shallow. If he opened his mouth, only red funnels would come out. He could not. Dolor Latour nonchalantly discarded the drained Brother Caraman-like refuse, then brought the epistolary closer to him. So close. Dubiel could smell its fetid breath, even over the stench of death and blood coming from himself. I would take your head, peel off the skin, and place it before the Lord of Skulls. Yet, you are a sorcerer, a vile weakling, who needs rely on witchcraft. A son of war turned to cowardice. You are not worthy of his throne. The wings changed angle, and Dubiel slid off them onto the ground. He could not use his legs to stop himself. He could not use his arms to halt the roll. When at last he skidded to a stop under the weight of his own armor, the demon appeared in his vision again. But it then reached down and turned the marine over. Dubiel now looked only down into the dirt as the demon came in again and whispered in his ear, I leave you here to die slowly, honorously, with the memory of the slaughter of your brothers in arms. And you can do nothing. Taste sodden ashes, little broken dying wizard, as I go to upturn all you believed in so full-throatedly. Dubiel lay there as the demon marched off, laughing. He saw dirt, he tasted ashes, and he raged. But he did not give in. Even now, he closed his eyes. He knew that the demon was right, the horrors of the day shot before his mind's eye. How Dolor Latour fell on them from above, utterly unawares. It was huge, winged, and wielded double blades. One axe, one sword. By the castus, the demon's massive sword planted so deep within him, his legs and thighs fell off, while his arms still flayed. The demon then dropped him and stamped on the remains, only retaining the head, all else was smashed to a paste. Brother Vigratus, who ran at the fiend, Balter raging as he drew his chainsword. Dolor Latour ignored the shots, even when one broke a horn from his head. The axe of the horror came down, smashing into the attempted parry of Vigratus. But the demon was too fast, too powerful. 
The thing's axe passed straight through Vigratus without stopping, the chain sword still whirring on the floor as the two halves of Vigratus fell apart. Brother Camuel had launched crack grenades at the demon, but in his one instance, Dolotor took defensive action and battered them away with his wings. Alas, the orbs flew directly back to Camuel, who was then torn apart in their explosion. And on, and on, all ten of Dubiel's honor guard, dead. He had slaughtered every marine that had come with epistolary Dubiel, only striking at him when all but one other were dealt with. And Dubiel had done his best. He had fought with every ounce of his skill. Yet every last psychic sigh had been disrupted by the huge brass collar that encompassed the demon's neck. Each time Dubiel had attempted to enhance one of his brothers, Dolator was too fast, and he executed that marine before the benefits could manifest. He left only brother Caramon. Dolator turned on Dubiel and came in at him like lightning. The librarian sent the power of the warp down his blade, raw energies of unmaking dancing on its edge. He fought against Dolator with all of his skill, yet his blade never touched the bloodthirster. And the battle was ended with four simple cuts. The demon's axe came down on Dubiel's leg, knocking him off his feet. The sword came down in his midriff and severed his spine. Then two more hacks, and Dubiel was left without arms of any use. Brother Caramon had leapt at the beast, but was swatted against a wall by a massive backhand. The demon then walked over and scooped up the marine. And the rest was history. Dubiel broke through these memories. He fought against the thirst. He fought against the black curse. He fought against death itself. Dubiel now went into himself. He reached within his mind and body and activated the twelfth gene seed organ. The Sooth Anne membrane awoke, and Dubiel went into hibernation. His mind closed down as much as his body, and he went into the darkness of the dreamless sleep of suspended animation. Upon waking, the first thing Dubiel experienced was the sound, the blipping of machines of the Mechanicum. No, it was not that. As his mind and body slowly awoke, Dubiel could feel himself struggling through a deep fog, as if his mind was shattered, his thoughts quicksilver and disjointed. He had been drugged. He could now hear better, closer, not as if in a bowl, and the light now stung his eyes, despite being protected by its unopened lids. He could not feel his body, his arms, his legs. He could not feel the air going in and out of his lungs, because it was not. Dubiel opened his eyes, and a pristine shine of light off metal burned into his retinas. As focus came, he could see the billows forcing air into his lungs, not via his throat. He could not move anything but his head, and only under supreme effort. A man in white robes walked from one door, heading towards an office. He stopped in mid-stride, as he casually flicked an eye over his now-awoken ward. He practically dropped his data slate as he rushed to Dubiel's side. He flicked one sensor after another, reading the signs before looking down into the eyes of the epistolary. It was sanguinary priest Turiel who now spoke in somber but gentle tones. Dubiel was in the apothecarium, and he knew what Turiel would say before it came out of his mouth. Brother Dubiel, I had feared you were too far gone to wake. I cannot be anything but your brother now. I must tell you the truth. Your body is broken. There is so little left. We could rebuild you, but the result. You would be a lumpen thing, more machine than man, forever in pain. And even so, it might not even be successful, and even if successful, 
it might not be for long. Dubel stared at him steadily, fighting through the pain-relieving stims that deadened his senses. There was something more. There had to be. Turiel had allowed long enough for the reality to sink in, and continued. But you have a choice. I have consulted with the captain. You can either accept the Emperor's peace, or you can accept the highest honor our kind can know. You can be interred. Speak your choice. Wilt thou go to fight on eternally at the Emperor's side in the other world, or wilt thou stay to serve on? And Ubiel spoke only one response. I choose the honor. Grant me the method for vengeance. And so, in the next hours, they did. Turiel nodded grimly, then injected more stims into his system. Turiel's face would be the last thing that Dubiel would see with his own eyes. She then saw only blackness. It was three days later that he awoke fully. As his mind returned to consciousness, he panicked for a moment, as he felt water in his lungs, his mouth. Then he panicked as he was assailed by the senses of two forms. One was warm and snug and motionless. Surrounded in red, his eyes would not open. His own heartbeat was echoed back at him through the liquids he was now huddled within. Like a memory of the womb, he felt protected. Then, the other sensory feed came into his mind, jumped into existence by the roar of machinery outside of his womb, his tomb and visions flickered before his mind's eye. He heard the hum of the ship, the blip and bustle of the forge, and before him now stood not only Brother Turiel, the sanguinary priest in his finest white robes, but standing next to him was Brother Carnastus in his red robes of Mars. The Tecmary Carnastus mumbled litanies as he checked over more data screens. It was Brother Turiel who spake first. Who are you? Dubel was confused for a moment as he instinctively retorted, yet the sound that came out. I am Epistolary Dubel of the Blood, scion of the chapter known as the Blood Spears. Turiel nodded and smiled warmly at him. Good, this is so. Now, Please move your right arm. Can you do that? And for the next hours, they went through checks and tests. Dubiel's body was now thing remade. It was odd indeed, but there was no pain. Not that this would make any difference to him. Dubiel was a Astartes. He was a space marine. And he thought to himself about his new form his new existence. It was like unto the black carapace and the way he felt in his old warplate. When he donned the power armor, he could feel through it, sense from it, like a second skin. And this present sensation was of a similar order, but of a different degree. He was one with the casing that he was now interned within. He could see through its senses could hear through its auspex arrays. He could feel and touch and even run. This decision to Turiel and Carnastus off guard, for never had they seen a brother take to the armor with such speed before, or at least in living memory. And this is what they told him at Test's end. He was now much taller than his brothers, much wider. And Dubiel knew it would take ordinance or specialized armature to pierce his new skin. He tested his strength and control, and found he could lift a rhino, manipulate it with ease. Though his hand was now so wide, it could engulf a man, though it could crush ceramite as if it were paper. It was like his own. His weaponry activated, 
he could reach out and touch others with melter or bolt of fire by extending his arm, and instead of ordering his finger to press down on a trigger, he now did so at a whim instead. He was one with every part of this great dreadnought armour. Yet one last thing remained, and neither Turiel nor Carnastus could offer any assistance. Now he centred in his new form and delved within. He looked into his very soul. Tubel calmed himself and reached for that which had always been with him since he received his second heart all those years ago. For it was then that his gifts were granted to him by the blood of the angel himself. And he reached into the void, and there it was. Nothing had changed. As he opened his mind and reached for the warp, he grasped it ever as easily as he did whilst breathing. He felt his spirit wings and the power of the blood suffuse him. He extended his mind, and a dart of power sheared from his soul. Warp changed rage honed into a razor's edge as it sailed forward. He was still who he was. He was still an epistolary, a psyker. Both Turiel and Canastus finally satisfied, Dubiel took himself off to the place he had to go. He headed to the bridge. The huge blast doors screeched as they opened wider than they had in decades, and in marched Dubiel into the expansive bridge heading towards its center. All watched him as he moved fluidly yet ungainly to stand at the foot of the stairs to the captain. Captain Joffiel was stern as he stood and then walked down the stairs towards the new librarian dreadnought. And then he saluted. Dubiel copied the motion as best he could. One arm had no hand, so it was not perfect, of course. For his left arm ended in a hand, indeed, but his right did not. There sat a weapon of surpassing power, more than a recompense for a fist. Captain Joffiel then spoke. My heart's fill with pride to see you walk amongst us again, Epistolary. This world is lost. We prepare to launch cyclonic missiles. The Dreadnought then retorted. I say nay. Captain Joffiel did not flinch or miss a beat as his right eyebrow shot up. A matter of honor, brother? I retorted the Dreadnought, and Joffiel responded. You know I should not risk such an asset, such a potent and rare warrior soul, let alone that which holds it, a gem without compare, an ancient artifact that may never be replaced. You see my conundrum, epistolary Dubiel. Make your case. Dubiel then began. A pity it is not that simple, my brother, my captain. To deal in numbers and strength, munitions and assets. I see thy concerns, thy needs as commander. Yet I make one counter. We are the blood. We are the sons of the angel. And we know. What does it matter if we are fully equipped? If the galaxy itself burns around our keeps? What does it matter if we are victorious? If we forget who we are? What does it matter if we live? If we suffer the arch enemy to lord over us? Down there is a demon who thinks himself the equal of our valor. Down there is a demon who has drunk of the blood and not known an accounting. Down there is a red-lipped demon who spits on our glory. I will go, alone if I have to, but I shall go. For it is the light of Sanguinius himself that shines in my eyes. It is his wrath that now moves me. It is his honor I set above my own existence. And with his words to my ears I say, in his name, I shall not suffer the unclean to live! All looked on, entranced. 
Captain Joffe nodded at last as he responded. And in his name, I shall not stand in your way. Go. Take what men will follow you on this march of doom. Bring our father's righteous flame unto his enemies. Dubiel turned to begin his march. Yet, there he did see it. For many of the space marines who stood on the bridge now turned and saluted to the Captain Joffiel. They requested permission to leave their duties and follow Dubiel. And for his part, the captain nodded again to each in turn. And they marched. Down to the bays and then out onto the drop pods they marched. The ten who came with him stepped into a teardrop of ceramite he himself had travelled in more times than he could recall, before Dubiel withstood a drop pod of equal shape but of different magnitude, for it was by far the largest he had ever witnessed. And it had to be, for Dubiel's form was now near four metres high, over three wide, two in length alone. He weighed twelve tons or more, near as much as an entire squad of his brethren. And down they went. Dubiel heard the rumble of the pod through the muffled comms of his suit. He felt its judder as it descended like a caress of the skin, instead of a pummeling from the G's he would have felt if he were still a man of flesh and blood. And then the deceleration burst straight before he struck down. Explosions rippled across the door frame as turbos then powered down the doors into massive ramps before him. Before even exiting the metal confines of the drop pod, Dubiel sensed the enemies in their multitudes. His storm bolter roared as he walked down onto the face of the planet. The Neverborn exploded under his wrath, shells piercing their forms and exploding from within. Red horns and teeth, bones and chains rained across the environment as his brothers, the other space marines, added their own barks of rage. The enemy were forced back, and like all of their evil stripe, they turned tail and ran. Cowards. But Jubiel then extended his mind. He touched the warp, and he drew on its power, like black sludge across his soul. Yet, he twisted it and formed it, and then sent it forth, a scream of his own. A challenge sent out in a language these filth could understand. And in what passed for their minds for miles around, his challenge resounded. Dolator, come to me, demon. We are not done, me and thee. Dolator, come, demon. Return to the fray if you dare. And Ubil did not have long to wait before he was rewarded. There, above the cathedral, barked Brother Benito. Dubiel looked up, and Benito was not wrong, for there it sat, its wings wrapped around itself, yet looking down as if any other gargoyle. But it was, of course, many times the size of the stone figures it emulated. Dubiel raised his right arm into the air, the one with the sinister grade weaponry built into it, the type of his dreadnought was clearly that of the base chassis of a Furioso, but where there should have been two fists, in one there was a false halberd. As sharp as a custody's blade, with all of the power of a dreadnought strength behind it, even were it not a focus for his potence, it would still be a thing of dread to all of the enemies of the Imperium. Yet, it was a weapon built on outlawed technology and it was a focus for all of Dubiel's mystic might. Dubiel's challenge was answered as the thing unfurled its wings and stood tall, its huge arms wide, axe and sword wreathed in fire, dripping blood, ready for the fray. It took one step off the building side and then swooped down, diving straight towards its prey, Dubiel. Yet this time, it did not have the advantage of surprise. Now Dolator sped at Dubiel openly, and he was ready for it. Dolator came down so fast, yet Dubiel surprised him to good effect. He grasped the warp and formed it to his will. As a son of the angel, he knew the godly ways, 
had mastered that which only the angel could teach. He remembered his training in the sanguinary discipline and deployed it now. Dark red blood-hued energies burst from his back and swept into the form of two wings. He beat them twice and launched from the ground to meet Dolorator in mid-air. Caught unawares, Dolorator could not alter course fast enough, and Dubiel slammed his fist towards the being, knowing he would be blocked easily. Dubiel was surprised, where before the demon could sweep such an assault aside with ease, but this was with but the force of an Astartes behind it. Now, Dubiel's fist smashed into the blade of Dolorator and forced it backwards, cutting into the brass ring at its neck and severing it, the two halves falling away. Fire and lava blood jetted from his self-inflicted wound in the top of its shoulder, and his howl would have perforated any mortal eardrum in its vicinity. Dubiel simply turned down his auditory senses. He could gain all the satisfaction he needed with his eyes. He did not need to hear its screams. Dolor Latour nearly struck the ground, only arresting his course by sweeping his wings wide, bringing him to a near stillness. And in that moment, Dubiel twisted in the air, ungainly as it may have looked, a limb square in the heavens, and he unleashed his spear. He called upon the warp again and formed it into the blood spear. Many meters long, it was made from his hate of the scum, and it flew towards the demon as fast as any last cannon discharge. Dubiel had aimed well, for in the instant that the demon slowed, the blood spear tore through its right wing, tattering it. The power of the spear did not only sever fleshy form, but also sent waves of red energy crashing down the membrane of its wing and into its body, burning Dolorator viciously. The demon threw back its head, but Dubiel did not hear its bellow. It landed now, and with it paused, launched its axe into the air at Dubiel. Tumbling end on end towards him, he had but a mere nanosecond to react. His body was not fast enough, and he defended himself with his gifts again. A shell of dark red energy enveloped Dubiel as he called upon the shield of Sanguinius. The demonic axe smashed into it and shattered it easily, but much of the force of its throw was removed from its flight. When the axe did connect, the armored plating on the dreadnought's shoulder rang and sizzled, but it did not collapse. It did not break. Dubiel swept up his halberd into the axe as it fell and sent it careening off into the distance. Now the demon only had his sword. Dolorator shook his fist at Dubiel, his tattered wing preventing him from engaging Dubiel in the skies. And so Dubiel dove down towards him, guns blazing. Dolorator danced sideways to avoid the metal blast, but merely used the bolter shot as a shower to ease his muscles, as they pinged off his demonic hide like a summer's rain. But Dubiel did not fly directly towards the demon, just in case it was playing lame duck, for the marine could not tell if he would regenerate that appendage and use it in the nick of time. And so he landed before the demon. Yet Dubiel did not feel that the melter shots were enough to put the demon off his stride. So he reached into the warp again, and he grasped more power than ever before, and he used it. The demon's legs flexed as he seemed ready to charge directly at Dubiel, yet the librarian's power kicked in faster, and Dolorator went down onto his knees in pain as the power of Dubiel coursed through his very veins and turned them into fire. Hissing came from the eyes and mouth of Dolor Latour as bursts of red mist came from them both. It was the blood that Dubiel had boiled under his very skin. It came out wherever it could, yet the demon was not yet done, and feigned weakness to goad the blood angel into making a mistake, for no demon of corn is ever stopped by mere pain. Dolor Latour took to his feet just as Dubiel rushed at him, a spurk now playing on his lips as he lashed out with his fell blade. Yet Dubiel was almost his own size now, and definitely an equal in strength. Nor was he slow. In fact, Dubiel, despite being in dreadnought armor, now moved as lithely and as swiftly as an unburned neophyte in the fighting pens. 
for he invoked the last relevant ability in the sanguinary discipline. He allowed the power of the warp to fill him, and it changed his very way of being. It was not like permitting the black rage or red thirst to take over. He was in total control, yet his form acted as if augmented by both of those curses. He unleashed his rage, yet it was the rage of the angel. It was his wrath. Thus, it was clear. Dubiel was still in control. This rage was pure. And as Dubiel moved faster than anything the demon had ever seen, he landed blow after blow on the sword of Dola Latour, who moved like the wind in his own defense. Again and again, Dubiel pummeled at the demon, with his left arm forcing him back. And at the very last, Dubiel feigned caution, a hesitation for a mere split second, as if tired by his burst of fury. And in that second, the demon howled in victory and raised his blade high. And he revealed his own undoing. Jubiel stepped forward and stuck as fast as he was mere seconds ago, as the demon looked down on his left arm preparing to block the power fist. It was then the Dorator's eyes widened like plates as Jubiel plunged his force halberd right into the midst of his chest. The edges of the halberd tore through the skin of the demon like it was passing through water and embedded in its very bones. It was then the Dubiel unleashed his power along its edge and down and into Dolla Latour's body, which juddered on the halberd like a fish caught on a hook. With every second he spasmed, Dolla Latour burned from the inside out. At the last, he discorporated, now ashes on the wind, as he was thrown from this plane, banished back into the void. Dubiel stepped back then looked at his brothers, who were keeping back the lesser demons. They killed with efficiency and purpose, and none would pass their vigil. Jubail opened comms to the ship above, a message for Captain Joffiel. I now request immediate extraction. Honor has been satisfied. Within the hour, the Blood Angels all stood on the bridge and watched the world go from a red-hued fire pit to a barren, broken thing of dead grey, as the cyclonic missiles penetrated the crust and dug down to the core, then exploded. The planet fell to pieces. Captain Joffiel turned and addressed the men. We have lost another world for the Imperium, but we have not lost our souls. There will be other battles, other worlds, and we the sons of Sanguinius, will be there. Next time, we will stop them. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. I hope you have enjoyed my story about Librarian Dreadnoughts of the Blood Angels. Now do hit the links in the description to check out Raid Shadow Legends and see if it's for you. It's quite jolly and quite a laugh. Now, as usual, hit like and subscribe. Give us a comment if you're able and if you feel it was worthy. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.